Thanks for coming to this uh, special uh, colloquium for the Cognitive Development Program. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Asriel Griezmann, also known as Ozzy. Uh, Dr. Griezmann is currently a, a visiting assistant professor at Hamilton College, which is not too far from us. Um, he received his PhD in 2012 uh, from uh, Rutgers University, uh, where he studied under Judy, uh, Judith Hudson. Uh, many of you may know uh, uh, Judith Hudson is one of the leading researchers uh, in studying children's future thinking. Um, so Dr. Wiesman's research uh, focuses on the lifespan development of uh, autobiographical memory and personal narratives, and he examines individual differences uh, in the developmental process. Uh, his uh, more recent work particularly focus, uh, focuses on the influence of gender and gender identity on the content, um, uh, on the content phenomenology and encoding process of autobiographical memory. Um, I believe um, Dr. Guzma is uh, in the process of becoming the person of gender and memory. So it's wonderful to have him here to with us. Uh, welcome. All right, thank you for the, the introduction, and it's, it's really a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, I guess I'll just jump right in. I want to introduce you to my research program. So I am trained as an autobiographical memory researcher, and I'll get a, a little bit more into what, what that means. But over the last few years, I've been uh, hunting, tracking, trying to figure out um, what what the deal is with gender in autobiographical memory. And so uh, a lot of my early work culminated in, in a review paper in 2013 that outlined what are the studies in autobiographical memory that are relevant to gender, what do they find, what do they show, and you know, therefore, ultimately, what is the relevance of gender to autobiographical memory. Uh, and one of the big challenges that I've found is that there's there's a lot out there. There's a lot of studies that find gender differences, but there's not a lot of consistency in the literature in a lot of different ways. And the trick then becomes, how do you find the signal out of that noise, right? How do you figure out, well, if 80 studies find gender differences and 100 don't, what does that mean? And we could use a meta-analysis, but almost every study uses a different dependent variable. So it gets kind of sticky. So um, I walked through some of the literature trying to point to what the differences are. And I'll, I'll show you some examples, and then I'll show you what some of the challenges are in interpretation, and then get to some data that I've, that I've designed to try to study this. So first, let's do the, the quick list. So women retrieve their autobiographical memories faster than men. That has been shown empirically. They can recall more in a four minute time span than men can, so quicker to get to the first one, as well as overall higher access than men. Girls more accurately recall ER visits than boys. So now we're talking about accuracy, not amount. Um, and another one about accuracy, here's a diary study where they had people keep a diary of events in their lives and then they tested them on their own diaries months later and um, women were more accurate than men there. Here in a free recall task, three hour interview, women recalled more information than men. Women rate their own memories as more vivid than men. So Tell me a memory, how vividly do you recall it? Scale of one to seven. Turns out women score higher for their memories on that scale than men do. And then when independent raters read transcripts of those memories, they also rate women's memories as likely being more vivid than men's. Um, and here's one of my favorite ones. This is a study by uh, Blois and Johnson. They presented people with stories about a couple, a man and a woman making a decision together. And there was a lot of decision-related information and a lot of emotional information relating to their relationship. And women remembered more of the emotional information than men did, but when instructed to pay attention to the decision-related information, women remembered more of that too. So we see this trend here throughout the literature suggesting that women do X more than men, they do X better than men, they do X faster than men. So the suggestion here would be that there is something about gender relating to the quality of autobiographical recall, potentially the amount, potentially the accuracy, uh, something that really needs to be better defined. 
There's also methodological challenges that come in with this research. So first of all, for every study that I can quote you that did find gender differences, I can quote you another one or probably two or three that don't. Um, and they're all using different dependent variables. So this gets into what I've called the opposite file drawer problem. Right? The file drawer problem from a methods point of view is that people only publish the statistically significant studies. And the ones that aren't significant, they get thrown in the file drawer and nobody ever sees them. So it seems from reading the psychology journals like everybody's finding significant things in their data. But turns out there's all this other research that isn't turning out as hypothesized. Well, with gender, we have the opposite problem. Because 90, maybe 95% of the people in the field of autobiographical memory and it's probably true of many other fields, they're, they're doing what's considered standard methodological practice. They're asking people to self-identify with gender. right? Self-identify, male, female, do you define yourself in some other way that's not in that binary? And then uh, they run a preliminary analysis. They use gender as a covariate. They pre-screen their data. And if they find something, they say, oh, found the gender difference. Let me do a quick search for gender in PsycInfo and see how I can include that in this paper. And if they don't, then they move on with their day and they say, we pre-screened for gender. No differences were found. We moved on. Right, but the people didn't enter these studies aiming to study gender differences. So in a meta-analysis, you, you, you look at data and you say, hey, here's all these studies that tried to study the same thing, and here's what they all found. Well, in this case, we don't have that. We have a bunch of studies that were interested in gender and a bunch of studies that weren't, and they're all reporting data. So how do we include all of those pieces of information? So what I did in this review was I looked and I found that turns out the gender differences are more consistent with children than with adults. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more. And they're more consistent in narrative data than in questionnaire data. So when you ask a questionnaire, how vivid is your memory? How well do you recall this event? You're doing something very different than when you ask somebody to describe their memory, and then you code that narrative for information. Uh, we also have this problem with defining gender. Right? Gender is a quasi-experimental variable. Right? Uh, if we find a gender difference, there's nothing in there that tells us where that gender difference came from. And so uh, we need to get a better sense Maybe, right? So gender is often used as this dichotomous participant variable, but what is it about gender that's driving these differences? If there's something about how men and women tend to behave, tend to think, tend to experience reality, then we should find that thing and measure that, because that's really what gender is cluing us into. And it's really not about some inherent brain difference that's based on your chromosome or something of that sort. So these are all the methodological challenges that need to be addressed. Um, and the other big one is defining memory and autobiographical memory. Because we have this rich tradition, right, dating back to the first experimental psychologist, right, Herman Ebbinghaus. We have this rich tradition of memory study in this, in this paradigm that says more is better. I give you a word list. If there's 20 words on the list, and you can remember 10, and I can only remember 8, then you have a better memory than I do. Right? That's the normative way of looking at memory and at memory paradigms, is to consider the goal of a memory task is to remember as much as possible. And that makes sense. We say, oh, you have a good memory. You have a better memory than me, because you can fit more in there. Uh, but is that really the goal? of autobiographical memory. When we talk about autobiographical memory, we're talking about memory for events that happened in our lives. We're talking about memories that are potentially relevant to a sense of self and connection to other people. And so there are many details that happen that are not necessarily relevant to my memory. So one of the things I like to do with my students in my classroom is I, I pick somebody out of the room and I say, how many light bulbs are there on the ceiling? And people look at me like I'm crazy. And I say, well, you all saw that there were light bulbs in this room, but you chose not to encode that. Right? You chose not to include that in your memory. So a memory that filters out irrelevant information and keeps relevant information would then be the most efficient form of memory system. And we would not be defining memory by uh, more equals better. 
So how have autobiographical memory researchers defined memory? Well, they've defined it in functional terms. Well, let's think about what it's for. And what is autobiographical memory for? So um, here are some, some luminaries of, of my field who have uh, done some great theoretical and great empirical work pointing uh, to three main themes in why we remember events from our lives. And the most obvious one is the directive function. We remember in order to influence behavior later on. Right? If I trip on the sidewalk, then I'll note, hey, remember there's that spot where the sidewalk's kind of uneven. Be careful next time you walk there. Right? If, I'm, if I'm out hunting, right? if I'm in the Pleistocene 20,000, 30,000 years ago, right? or a million years ago, I'm hunting and I remember, hey, there's a lot of cattle that tend to graze here. I'm going to come back here next time. So that's the most obvious uh, form of memory functions. There's the self function, which is understanding myself which can have all kinds of benefits, but it's something we just tend to do. We want to get a good sense of who we are. We want to understand how we behave in, in different scenarios, and we keep a sense of self. So that's one good reason to remember. And then there's the social function of autobiographical memory. We build intimacy. We build friendships via conversations. Family dinner time conversations are really important culturally. We uh, want to get to know people, so you tell them about your past. You tell them about your different experiences because you think that gives a good sense of who you are. So we build bonds via autobiographical memory sharing. So none of these, right, none of these suggest that more is better. More could be better, uh, but more might not be better. And so I want to just keep that in mind. And I, and I, and I put this little note here, right, note the, the relevance of relevance. So how, how important is, right, how relevant is something to a story you're telling about yourself? So I have, I have a sister-in-law who, whenever she tells a story, everybody's like, get to the point already, get to the point, because she's including all this information that we don't really think is relevant to the story that she's telling. And so um, we've got individual differences in how much we share. Um, so the model of how autobiographical memory develops, what I, what I base my work in, is the model of uh, Nelson and Fivish, which really encapsulates decades of work by um, half a dozen or a dozen researchers, uh, working with a lot of parents and children, and focusing what they call it the social cultural developmental theory. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, the idea here is that we all know that we have a, a memory skill. We all know that we have brain capacities for memory, but again, the question is, how do we remember? What is it that is influencing our memory? And what leads us to pay attention to some information and not others? And so there's a lot of research linking the way mothers talk to their children about memories that teaches children, this is how you talk about your memory. This is the type of information people are interested in, right? People get scaffolded, right? Using, using a very intentionally Vygotskyan term, right? We scaffold uh, our children's memories with questions about goals, beliefs, desires, theory of mind, right? What was, what was your brother thinking? What was your sister thinking? These are examples that we will include in our in our conversations with our children. So yeah, I like to use the example, my kids, my, my son is two years old now, and he's learned that when we sit down for a meal together, we ask, how was your day? And that's something that we do in my family, right? We both come home from work, and I say, hey, how was your day? And so first there's, you know, he would, we'd sit down at breakfast, and he'd say, how was your day? I said, I just woke up. What do you mean, how was my day? So now somebody else asks him, how was your day at breakfast? He says, no, you say, how was your sleep? Um, <laughs> My son's too. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, on the other hand, right, if I ask him how was your day when he had a day at daycare, he'll say, I played, I ate, and I came home. And I, and I say, well, in my head, I'm saying, well, you do those things every day. You haven't really told me any unique information. But my daughter, who's four years old, and she's a little bit further along the path of development, she knows to say, oh, I had this really exciting game today with my new friend, Quinn, and this is what we did. Right? She knows I'm not asking about her schedule at daycare. I'm asking about specific events. Well, how does she know that? That's come from cultural expectations, from learning from the types of questions that my wife and I have asked her 
about things that happen. She's learning what kinds of information is relevant. Now, this model, and I I'm, I'm, did not mean to contrast my son and daughter in terms of gender. It's just a, it's more of an age thing at this point. Um, but this opens the door for gender differences because if parents speak differently to their daughters than to their sons, then we've got a gender-based version of scaffolding, right? So we have parents asking different questions to their daughters than to their sons. Girls are learning this is the way to report a memory, but boys are learning that is the way to report a memory. And in fact, this is the case. So we know, you can, you can take a look here, um, Robin Fivish and, and her, her student Widad Zaman had a, had a nice review paper that emphasized the different ways that mothers talk to their daughters versus their sons. Um, <clears throat> not only mothers, fathers too, but most of the data comes from mothers. Uh, there's also gender differences in children's style of play, which reinforces gender normative expectations. Right? Girls play in small pairs, triads, often with conversation. Uh, again, these are generalizations, but tendencies. And boys often play in larger groups with more rules and hierarchy and less actual dialogue. And these reinforce gender norms about how to recall a memory. And these have the potential for long-term effects by Right, by sculpting how it is that we learn to, to tell a memory narrative. We also have the added piece here of how or whether gender is viewed as relevant. And this is uh, an important, I'm, I'm referring her to, to an important review paper in the social psychology world that emphasizes three elements of any interaction that could highlight gender. The person, right? So the, the person remembering, I'm, I'm applying it to my, to my own work. There's the person remembering, there's the audience, there's who's listening. And then there's the scenario. Some scenarios highlight gender and others don't. Whether it's uh, a gender stereotypical activity, whether it's uh, about groups or friendships or boyfriends and girlfriends or sports, there are many different ways in which gender can become relevant to the recall context. And one of the things that has to get asked is, what part of gender are we interested in? So that becomes relevant as well. And that leads into this question of potential moderators and mediators. So potential things that could be influencing this scenario here. We've got contextual factors. So in my own work, I've shown that the conversational partner, so here's that audience factor, right? The gender of the conversational factor, uh, of the conversational partner, elicits differences from men than from women. So in my particular work, I found that men were uh, much more expressive speaking to a female experimenter than they were speaking to uh, a male experimenter. And I also noticed in terms of data collection, are we in the laboratory replicating what it's like to share an autobiographical memory? Or are we asking people to type their narratives in eight minutes? Um, I often ask people to type their narratives um, because there is an assumption that you've been sharing this over time and you've, you've built this memory over time. But the context of sharing is, is, is essential to understanding to understanding memory differences. And I've found that men and women respond differently to typing versus speaking in terms of context. Right? And so if we're thinking back about all these inconsistent findings, some of these studies, participants were typing their narratives. Others, they were speaking them to an individual. And we have to ask about what kinds of data. Right? Are we eliciting narrative data? Or are we eliciting self-report data? And I've, I've discussed that already. But um, who's defining the format of the answer? Are we seeding control? To the, uh, to the research participant? Or are we uh, maximizing the internal validity of our experiment at the expense, the potential expense, of our ecological or external validity? So how much are we putting in the hands of the participants? And if we're constraining too much, we might be implicitly telling our participants, don't get into too much detail here or there. We just want the facts or something of that sort. And that if we remove that constraint, maybe our memories will look different. We also need to think about individual factors, and I want to focus specifically here on age. And I said our findings were more consistent with children than with adults, but the majority of the adults in our studies are college students. So I'm assuming most of you are here in a human development program. You would know that that's probably a, that, that has the potential to be a major fallacy in research, right? Referring to college students as adults 
they, college students are adults in many respects, but they are in the middle of a unique developmental phase known as emerging adulthood. And emerging adulthood is the time of life in which men and women are actually most similar in many regards. Right? Once we get to adulthood, traditional gender norms start to, start to come much more often. Right? Parenting, job market, marriage, um, all kinds of things that elicit a greater awareness of gender. The playing field is much more similar for men and women uh, in the college years than outside of it. So uh, as an overview, looking at a sociocultural approach to autobiographical memory, thinking about accountings for, accounting for DV methodologies, thinking about age, gender typicality, gender identity. I've had a lot of trouble with the terminology here. I submit to one journal, they say stop using the word gender identity, so I change it to gender typicality. The next journal says don't use gender typicality, use something else. So I, I'm playing with, with terminologies here, but what I mean is uh, differences that happen to differ by men and women, whether or not they're explicitly connected to gender. And I'll, I'll get into specifics there. And then there's this big question of, do women actually remember more than men, or do they just report more than men? Right? And that's, that's a piece there. Right? Is, is this about how much I think I'm supposed to talk about, or is this about how much I actually have stored, actually have recalled? Is this encoding? Is this retrieval? There's a lot of open questions here. So let's look at study one. I've got two main studies I'm going to per present to you here, and I'm going to flip back and forth between them. So I'm going to do study one and two questionnaire data, and then I'm going to do study one and two narrative data. So here's study one. It's written up in these three papers over here. We collected data online using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. This is a web-based platform for finding participants on the cheap. Um, participants completed four narratives. If you know anything about Amazon's Mechanical Turk, you'll know that they don't like to, participants on this website don't like to sit for more than 20 minutes, half hours. So we split this into two tasks. We did um, first two narratives, took a break, invited them back uh, a week later, did the next two narratives, got about a 70% return rate. So that was pretty good. Got a wonderful sample size here. So we divided people into age 18 to 29, 30 to 40. So we compared these two different uh, adult groups. After each memory narrative, participants completed a questionnaire. The MEQ, the Memory, memory Experiences Questionnaire, it's a 60 item questionnaire. We cut it down to 30. Um, and it divides into these 10 subscales. And these are what we call phenomenological aspects of memory, right? So how coherent does it feel to you? How accessible, how quickly did it come to mind? What do you remember about visual perspective? Do you remember it like it's from your own eyes, like you're an observer watching over it? How vivid is it? How positive? How far away do you feel? How emotional was it? How well do you remember the timing within it? So a lot of your standard uh, questions about memory quality, about how well you remember it. Um, and then after all four memory narratives, participants completed the PAQ, which is Janet Spence's uh, gender, we'll call it the gender typicality scale. And I'm going to focus in on the feminine subscale. We'll look for a second at the masculine subscale, but the feminine subscale is really the one that's more relevant to my work. And this is eight trait terms, um, and people rate how much does this describe me. So emotional, gentle, helpful, warm, kind, understanding, aware of feelings, devoting of self. This is, these are stereotypical norms. These are terminologies that are typically associated with women, although we'll see that uh, it's not actually the most accurate in that regard. So there's study one. There's the method. Four memory narratives recalled. Each one gets rated. Each one gets coded. Uh, I've got a few hypotheses here, right? One, gender is going to matter. We're going to see gender differences somewhere in these data. Number two, that gender is not just going to be a dichotomous thing. It's going to have something to do with gender roles, gender norms, that specific, that PAQ item. And that we're going to see some moderations. Um, we're going to see an effect of age. And we're going to see an effect of testing methodology, differences between narrative and self-report. So it's an important first step when you're, when you're collecting data. You should make sure that your measure of gender norms actually varies by gender. Uh, would make sense that our feminine gender norms, women should score higher on this trait. And in fact, they do, but only in the 30 to 40 age range. So women, age 18 to 29 in this sample, and this is a sample, right? Each of these bars is 49 individuals. Women in this sample did not score higher on feminine typical traits than men. 
Um, so what you're seeing here is a gender effect qualified by a gender by age group interaction, such that women age 30 to 40 score higher than men on these traits, uh, self-report themselves as higher than men on these traits, but uh, in the 18 to 29 year old, people don't. Right, sorry. Did it actually go up with age or did it just go down with age? Um, so I'm pretty sure both of these are significant. I have to double check it. Um, <clears throat> okay. So here's my MEQ, my 10 subscales. Uh, I'm talking about a literature that inconsistently shows gender findings. So it's kind of nice that we've got some inconsistent effects here. So three out of 10 subscales show a main effect of gender. Four out of 10 subscales show an interaction gender by age group. And uh, that following that same pattern of women scoring higher than men, but only in the 30 to 40 age range. And the, the wonderful thing about this finding is that if we bring in the PAQF as a covariate, what you see is that every single one of these effects gets mediated, is no longer significant, is simply overshadowed by a correlation between feminine typical traits and higher self-reported ratings of these memory variables. So on nine out of 10 subscales, we are seeing small to medium correlations between self-described feminine typical traits and better memory quality. And so this is, it's kind of what we call a, a moderated mediation model where gender seems to matter, age seems to matter, but really the way in, in which they matter is that they predict feminine typicality, which then predicts self-reported memory quality. Um, and so the question is why these traits? So let's look again at these, at these items here. These are picking up on a gender, a, a, a perception of gender as typical in terms of women as being more emotional and more socially connected to other people. Um, <clears throat> and right, that, that social connection involves caring for others, being more aware of others. And this, right, this, this work has been uh, supported to, to be found cross-culturally across many different countries, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously this isn't descriptive of every man and woman. It's, it's really not. Uh, telling difference to men and women in the emerging adulthood years, but this is a pretty standard gender norm. So if we're thinking back at that social function, right, that social function of remembering, well, I'm remembering my events better because I'm sharing them more consistently with others. So I'm getting reinforced for those memories. I'm thinking about them more often, and I'm also thinking when they happen, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this with my friends, and that might uh, be increasing my perception of this as a stronger memory or even as a stronger memory. Um, let's look at study two momentarily. So study two, I took the same procedure, and I tried to replicate it with the Hamilton College student population, but I pre-screened the students for PAQF traits. So if this would replicate that men and women didn't differ in the college years based on these feminine traits. I would want to find our highly feminine women and our low feminine men to look for differences. And in fact, in a sample of 428 students, again, I did not find gender differences on the feminine subscale. Um, we would call them trending, but with 428 people, if you're not going to find an effect, there's really not much there. Um, Conversely, on the masculine subscales, men scored higher than women. That was true in both samples. So uh, we pre-screened we pre participants, developed four groups. Um, you might think I should have developed six groups. It was very hard to find high PAQF men and also kind of hard to find low PAQF women, although they, they were, there were some of them in the sample. Um, and I was also kind of limited in terms of resources. But what we have here are four groups where we've got women who scored high on this stereotypical feminine scale, men who scored low on it, and men and women who scored in the middle. So now we have four discrete groups. We can't look at feminine, subs, feminine typical traits as a covariate anymore. It's now a grouping factor. And if you look at the same four narratives, right, last two years, high point, low point, self-defining, I didn't introduce these um, narrative prompts. So they were meant to, like, this one was meant to be as open-ended as possible, and then they were to get progressively more kind of emotionally intense to get people more and more involved. We had some interesting questions uh, to compare event types to each other, but they were really, um, the, the results are just, they're not as exciting as, as the rest of the rest of what I wanted to present, as far as I'm concerned. So what you're seeing here is 
that the men who scored low on the feminine traits, they rated their memories as lower. So what I did here, um, now this is now looking at seven of the 10 MEQ subscales. These are often combined as referring to the quality ones, whereas how positive and how far away it is and how much you share it are, are less related to that. Um, and this is just, I've done this in a few different methodologies, but this is just the best for, for portraying it. And what I want to emphasize here is that if we look at the partial ADA scores, we see that dividing by feminine typical traits accounts for substantially more variance than if we just divide it by gender. One of the challenges in this study is separating gender from feminine typical traits because they're not independent because I've oversampled high, high feminine typical women and low feminine typical men. Um, so I'll be, I'll be making these comparisons between how much variance is being described by feminine typical traits versus straight up by gender. So again, study two, replicating this finding that uh, feminine typicality, as defined by Janet Spence, seems to be predicting memory quality in questionnaires more so than is gender. And this could be an explanation as to why there are inconsistent findings in the literature, right? It could just be that we're not getting sufficiently diverse samples on feminine typical traits since college students all tend to score uh, kind of similar on that. Let's look at the narrative analysis. So these narratives, there's about 800 of them in study one. It's about 1,000 of them, and I'll explain why in study two. These were coded on six different coding methodologies. The first five are zero to three scales. Each one comes with a manual. They're pretty, they're pretty short. The manuals are maybe four pages long. You know, It took two students in my lab eight weeks, 40 hours a week to code half of the data here. So it's, it's a very uh, involved process, you know, inter-rater reliability and all of those things. Let's just give a quick run through. We, we tried to pick out which aspects of memory should be most relevant to gender, or which aspects of memory should gender be most relevant to. So the first two, connectedness and agency, these are those stereotypical traits. That's the PAQF and the PAQM, right? Connectedness to others. And agency is generally defined as a highly mask or uh, as more typically masculine. I have more to say about that afterwards. This coding system looked at something like if you had a barrier in your life and you overcame it, that would be an expression of agency. If you referred to yourself as being helpless, you'd score really low on that scale. Factual and interpretive elaboration, how much information is a person including about what happened versus about what they thought about what happened or how they're interpreting what happened. So, um, and these again, zero to three scales in terms of the amount of detail included. Thematic coherence is about how well the narrative fits together. Does it stay on topic? Is a theme identifiable? Is it related to a sense of self? Is it connected to past, connecting past events to future events? And then finally, affect language. We simply counted words. We counted words that convey emotion. Let me give you a sample of what this narrative coding looks like. So here's a participant. I'll read this. You don't have to strain. Uh, here's a participant in my Hamilton College study. And here we've got their coding scores on the side. Uh, I was in Italy on choir tour and I had an existential crisis. This is a low point narrative. We were in Venice and I'd consumed an entire bottle of wine in the company of some of my fellow choir members in our hotel room. We've been talking about our significant others and this is the moment I realized subconsciously that the person I'd been dating for over a year was not the person I wanted to be with any longer. After most of the group left, I was still in the room with two of my good friends. I started to panic. I'd begun to ruminate on our complete lack of control on the societal scale, on the cosmic scale. For some reason, I found it terrifying that nothing was holding our fragile world in place except momentum? What if something shifted the pattern of the Earth and we are forced into a new trajectory? Yada, yada, yada. I realized this was a metaphor for the momentum of my relationship. I had spent a year of my life with somebody who I fundamentally had nothing in common with and who I didn't truly love, but I was telling myself that I did. Uh, I was terrified of change, yada, yada, yada. I thought I'd be stuck here forever. Six months later, I broke up with my boyfriend. Okay? It's heartfelt. I think we can identify with what's going on, and even if we, maybe we all haven't been in that hotel room in Venice, but I think, we, I think we know what's going on, what it's like to be in this scenario. And this person's portraying it really well. So let me walk through the different coding systems, right? Affect terms. 
It's got an eight on affect terms because there's eight affect terms, terms conveying emotional states. It gets a really high score on interpretive elaboration because almost nothing actually happens in the narrative. The person's just talking about what they're thinking about. So that's all interpretive. That's not a bad thing, right? That's, that's a highly interpretive narrative. It's a narrative that's focusing in on thoughts and feelings as opposed to factual elaboration, right? Here's what happens in the narrative. We can sum it up in a sentence and a half. So uh, those are the facts, and it gets a zero on the zero to three. And, and, I, and I work a lot with my students, right? When you give us a score that's low, you're not saying this is a bad narrative. You're just saying this is what the narrative's talking about. Um, here's agency, right? I was terrified of changing course, convinced that I didn't have that option. Right? That's a lack of agency. I spent the next six months in limbo before I was finally able to overcome this and break up with my boyfriend. So this is an expression of agency, and it gets high on the agency scale. Um, and here's connectedness. The whole narrative is about the relationship, and so it gets scored high on connectedness. Finally, thematic coherence, right? Everything tightly fits together in a theme. It connects to sense of self. It even talks about what happened after this event, and those are all considered relevant for thematic coherence, and so it gets a high score on thematic coherence. That's a little bit about what narrative coding is like. Um, and so those are the different variables. We walked in with a hypothesis. We're going to code six narrative variables. We really thought that five of them would differ by gender in terms of women scoring higher than men. Thematic coherence was kind of a maybe within those five. And then agency, we thought, well, there's this stereotype that men express more agency than women. And so we'll go with that prediction as well. Here's study one. We're back to our online participants. Three of the six. Um, three of the six narrative coding systems show effects. The first two are rather small. Uh, that's affect and factual elaboration, where women score higher than men on affect and factual elaboration. They include more facts, not just more interpretations. Well, not more interpretations in this sample. And then connectedness, we get a really high effect. Women are much more connected in their narratives. In terms of the PAQF, right, feminine typical traits as a covariate, that covaries nicely with the connectedness in narratives. So we're looking across domains. I describe myself as a socially connected person. And in my narratives about experience, I write about myself as a socially connected person. So that, that makes sense. We had no uh, null effects on the other three coding systems. Study two. Um, was a bit more powerful, but I want to introduce to you uh, the full procedure of study two because it was more than just a replication. Times three and four in study two were a replication of study one, but they were sandwiched in between a few other uh, memory narratives. So participants got pre-screened. They got invited to take part in a study. We said, semester-long study. We're going to send you five half-hour surveys over the course of the semester. We'll pay you 20 bucks. We got a lot of college students interested, um, enough to, to keep them, to, to build our sample over the course of two semesters. Time one and two, we got some really short-term events. So something that happened today, something that happened 24 hours, something that happened on the first day of classes, which was a week ago. Uh, we got your Hamilton College acceptance letter, which I'm not going to talk about today. And then at time five, we retested them on the first three events. So at time five, we said, uh, hey, remember you talked about, and we gave them a five-word summary of their previous narrative. Tell us about it again. Um, so we can get the, the point of doing this short-term versus long-term. If, if women are actually better at remembering, is it that men forget over time? Or is it that women actually encode more detail to begin with? And so let's start with the replication. So first of all, on the six coding variables, Five of the six showed gender differences. Here we have with the, right, the, the, the two pinks are the high feminine women and the low feminine women. The circles are the high feminine women. And sometimes they were higher than the low feminine women, sometimes not. But we have here factual elaboration, women providing more of that. Affect, women providing more of that. And that's both in the short term and in the long term events. Agency, no real gender differences on agency again. Here are other three scales. Interpretive elaboration, we see a main effect of gender. Connectedness, and both of these are across short-term events and long-term events. And finally, thematic coherence, we get a gender effect, but only in long-term events, which could make sense, right? Things that just happened yesterday, they're less exciting. There's less thematically going on. OK, so we're now supporting our predictions, right? First time around, we got it right three out of six. Second time around, we got it right five out of six. Yay, that's more exciting. Um, but what we're seeing here is substantial gender differences. What about feminine typical traits? 
What about the role of feminine typical traits? We saw they were highly influential in questionnaire variables. What about in narrative variables? So this is a, this is a bit of a mouthful or a bit of an eyeful. Um, what I have here in red are all the effects where we don't see a substantial change between the variance explained by simply comparing gender and the variance explained by looking at feminine typical traits. So all of these scenarios, right, there's six of them out of a possible 12 comparisons, we see effects and we don't see them differ between gender and gender typicality. Now again, this isn't a pure random sample of gender. This is gender that is specifically recruited with regards to feminine typicality, but um, we should see more variance explained if feminine typicality is really making a difference, and it does in these four other scenarios. So these are scenarios in which the eta square is different by more than three. It's by more than 0 0.03. It's really, there's a big difference in thematic coherence for short-term events. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of an influence of feminine typicality uh, in this second study. There was almost no influence of feminine typicality in the first study, right? It was just connectedness. Here we're seeing a little bit more, right? Connectedness, thematic coherence, factual elaboration. So we're in the ballpark. Narrative variables differ more by gender than questionnaire variables. In questionnaire variables, that might have something to do with feminine typical traits, because people aren't measuring that. In narrative variables, well, feminine typical traits might matter, but straight up gender seems to be doing enough to find these differences. Um, just because I did present you this whole procedure, there's this open question of, is it about encoding? Is it about retrieval that I mentioned to you? Right? Um, she has done some work a few years ago. She got closer to when the initial events are happening. Right? She got maybe like half an hour. People were getting texted and saying, tell us something that happened in the last half an hour. Um, so I got something in the last day, and I retested participants on it. And here, um, Nathan tells me that some of you have used this uh, coding system. This is a coding system published by Brian Levine that codes for episodic and semantic details. And what we're seeing here, um, the semantic details are at the bottom. There are non-significant differences between men and women. But the differences between men and women on uh, episodic details are that women seem to be reporting more episodic details than men. And it's happening at time one. It's happening within a day of the event occurring. And it's not getting bigger. It might be getting smaller, but that interaction is non-significant. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that gender differences in amount recalled, in episodic detail recalled, is happening from the moment we're starting. So don't look at this and say, oh, women have better memories than men. They can remember more over time. This seems to suggest women encode more details to begin with. And I'm trying not to use the word better anyway. Um, OK, so that's a nice little added feature of what was collected in study two. So just to, just to sum up, for now, across study one and study two, feminine gender norms seem to matter for questionnaire variables. They seem to mediate gender by age interactions. Uh, and this might help ex explain the inconsistency in the literature as I've been driving home. Narrative variables, less so. Uh, these gender differences are not overridden by feminine typical traits, although feminine typical traits seem relevant. Um, I promised some new work in um, the little sign that was up on the door, so I wanted to just get to this. So where, where I'm pushing now with this work is, OK, let's, let's assume that gender differences in autobiographical memory are real. Right, let's say they're real, and the reason they're cropping up in different places is methodological. We can do methodological work to try to figure out why they're here and why they're not there, and how to best sample if we're interested, and why this theoretically matters. What I'm interested in doing now is, and this is, there's been an argument in, in the literature, especially coming from, from Robin Fivish, who's one of my mentors, uh, that people, people know this. People are aware of this, that, that us psychologists are not the first ones to get to this. And that this is something you know in your day-to-day -day interaction. You know what a, women, a woman's autobiographical memory sounds like versus a man's. You have certain gender-based expectations. Let's call them an implicit stereotype of what a man's report of what happened sounds like versus what a woman's report of what happened sounds like. And so I thought, let's show people these narratives and see if they can guess. 
but let's show people. So I got permission from my study two participants to show their individual narratives anonymized to a new group of people and have them guess, are these narratives written by men or by women? So pilot study, we take 24 narratives from study two. We remove pronouns. We change every reference to he and she to he slash she. We change every boyfriend and girlfriend to significant other. We block out individualized names. Um, we screen out specific references, and I was going a lot on the expertise of my students here, right? Oh, everybody's going to know that's a woman because there's a Sarah Bareilles song in there, so you either need to get the Sarah Bareilles song out of there or find a new narrative, right? Somebody referred to silly pens, and everybody thought that was written by a woman. Um, we edited out language. We changed words from giggle to laugh, from erection to being aroused, so that people wouldn't be able to use specific words to identify if they were written by men or women. And then we brought people into the lab. We said, read these narratives and tell us if you think they're written by a man or a woman. Tell us how confident you are. So we've got 24 repeated measures. Uh, we've got two dichotomous dependent variables. Did they get it right or not? And what did they guess? So we've got two different ways to analyze these data. Um, so I'm using a repeated measures binary logistic analysis using generalized estimating equations in SPSS. I say all that because if there's anybody here who knows how to use that, I'd love to talk to you because uh, I'm, I'm learning, but people are better than books, in my opinion, in teaching stats. Um, 81 participants, which means we have almost 2,000 unique data points here that are all yes, no. And here's what the data look like. So pilot study round one. Uh, Affect, coherence, and interpretive elaboration were all highly correlated, so I combined them into one variable. They're highly predictive. The more of these, the more people guess female. The more connectedness, the more people guess female. The more factual elaboration, the more people guess female. In terms of getting it right or not, women tended to get it right more than men. People who were more confident tended to get it right more often. And then the more affect, coherence, and interpretive elaboration, people got it right also. Okay, there's some kinks that need to get worked out here. Number one, a lot of these narratives actually don't, they actually vary by gender. So women actually used more of all of these things in these narratives. So we're not sure if people are guessing because of a bias or if they just happen to be getting it right for some other reason and it's correlation and not causation. So in study one, we cut it down to 18 narratives. I sat with my lab and we, we poked holes, right? Anybody who had like higher than 80% guessing one way, we thought, why might they be doing this? We excluded a few narratives. One of our narrators got really excited over gluten-free yogurt in the cafeteria. And 95% of people said that was a woman. And we said, well, we're not studying gluten-free yogurt biases. So um, let's move on to something else. We moved our blocks into all male and all female. So it couldn't be that people were making relative judgments and saying, oh, well, the last three I guessed were female, so this one I'm going to guess male. And we can really separate uh, getting it right from guessing male or female, because in the male block, there's always one right answer. In the female block, there's always one right answer. And so now there's two separate analyses. The data have to be analyzed separately, because the relative judgments are being made relative to the block. We told people two blocks. Each of them is about half male, half female. So we used a little bit of deception. Uh, one of my first times using deception in research. Nobody, nobody suspected a thing. Um, and here we have beautiful results. So confidence predicts correct in both. Uh, and affect, coherence, and interpretive elaboration, again, predicts getting it right for men, predicts getting it right for women. So does factual elaboration. The more factual elaboration, the more people are going to guess it was written by a woman. The more affect, coherence, interpretive elaboration, the more likely they're going to guess it was written by a woman. So we still have this problem that maybe it was just these narratives. And so that's what study two is about. Um, I can just skip this. Um, so in study two, which we've got 60 participants collected at the moment, we got a new narrative data set and we're trying to replicate before uh, we try to draw any firm conclusions. So in summary, um, gender differences in autobiographical memory exist. The question is, why do they exist? What do they tell us about memory and how is that valuable? Uh, does this potentially have applications to the courtroom? Well, maybe, but we're really far away from that at this point. We're, we're really more at the level of trying to understand what are people doing with their memories and what do these differences tell us about different people's goals when they remember? 
And so if there are gender differences, what does that tell us about development? What does that tell us about uh, stereotyping traits, people who fit into these stereotypical traits versus don't? Does an awareness of that matter? And so future direction, I'm going to be looking into conversational interactions, so bringing people in and having them talk with each other, with longstanding friends, with people they've just met, uh, to try to better understand some of these dynamics and some of these goals people have for remembering. So thank you very much. Time for questions, or I know I, I went a little bit over, apologize for that. In your lit review, when you talked about how there's research that shows that parents talk differently to their children um, based on gender in terms of memory, can you just elaborate a little bit more about what they found in terms of how it's different from the daughter? Sure. Um, so elaborating is, is the perfect word, because they've hit on that as a term, elaborations. They have found that mothers ask content questions, who, what, where, when, why, to their daughters more than to their sons. They have found strong correlations over time between how many of these questions mothers ask and how much information student, uh, children have in their memory six months later, a year later, five years later. There's been a long-term study that brought people back 10 years later. So they brought them in at 3. They brought them in at 13. And the 13-year-olds whose mothers asked them more content questions uh, had earlier first memories than, than, the, than, the student, than, than the kids whose mothers asked them less. They have trained mothers who don't ask a lot of content questions to ask more content questions. And they have found that their kids then have um, more detailed memory for long-term events than other kids whose mothers haven't had that same kind of training. So that, that's a bit of, of the a quick summary of what's going on in the literature. I have a couple questions. Um, we're going to different ends of this. So one of them is suggested that maybe women are encoding more information because you're getting that higher level of detail. Is there any sort of attentional benefit? Like, do you see a gendered effect in attention um, with women? So that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't have measures of attention in my work. The, the problem with this encoding argument is that when we talk about autobiographical memory, we need to give it enough time to actually become autobiographical. And by that point, we've missed out on encoding. Right? So it, from, a, from a theoretical point of view, I, 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 I don't really have much. I've got an anecdotal argument, which is I went to my doctor and said, I, my wife is telling me that we did X, Y, and Z, and I have no recollection of it. And he said, you should listen more when she talks, um, which was a kind of stereotyped statement. And maybe, maybe there is an attention faction that, a factor in there. Um, but uh, that's as good as I've got right now. So it's, it's, a, it's a really important question. There's, there's two studies that I know of that have vaguely gotten at encoding. Right? There's cheese and there's mine. And, um, that's all I've got so far, so it'd be an interesting future direction. I was wondering if you could also comment on the potential loose association between pro-social behavior and the quality of autobiographical recollection. Yeah. And how that might be driven by some of these underlying. So I think that's, that's one of the most promising future directions. Uh, some of the work I had with my students, we were, we were mining uh, study two. And my students found that Right? Women scored higher on connectedness than men. Right? I showed you that already. But there is a correlation between women's connectedness scores in their narratives and their self-reported well-being, using well-being scales. But for men, that correlation was not there. So we had a nice interaction in a mixed model analysis such that um, being socially connected mattered for women. But that being socially connected in, right, in this narrative measure didn't matter for well-being for men. So I think that social sharing is, is highly relevant. I have found, I've just started measuring, uh, like, how do you measure social sharing? Well, how often have you shared this memory? How often do you generally share memories? So I, I've started asking a few of those questions and tend to find that people who share more have score higher on a lot of, the, a lot of these variables. So, I think it has a lot. I think it has a lot to do with it, and I think that there's this there's this desire amongst some researchers, myself included, to push towards right, ecological validity in our methods. So, really looking at that sharing process, 
Because there's this fascinating cognitive literature that shows that sharing it actually makes memory worse. Right? It's called collaborative inhibition, that people who try to remember in groups do more poorly than if they had all tried to remember it individually and put it all together. So it seems as though thinking about the function of social remembering and are the benefits coming from the actual sharing or are the benefits coming, right? right? So are they coming from I shared this and that reinforced the memory or are the benefits coming from I'm thinking of sharing this and so I'm going to encode it better? So it, it raises some really promising directions, but um, again, there's very, liter very little on, on that, you know, connecting it to these methods. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a couple of method methodological questions. Sure. One is, when you did that one where you were showing the difference between the feminine traits and the gender, yeah. why didn't you do a mediation there? Why was it two separate regressions? Is it, because um, there's, is it because one is those groups that you chose? You're talking about these? Separate, are these still between groups? Is that why? So here's the problem. Um, so I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm comparing an analysis based on separating participants by gender and separating participants based on their PAQF group. So high feminine women, average feminine women, high, uh, average feminine men, and low feminine men. Those two groups aren't independent from each other. So I can't put them into a mediational model together because part of the reason, right, so. But so it's that, different from what you did in the first one where you put in their PAQ scores yes. and you mediated all. Why didn't you do that one? I'm, not, I'm just oh, asking I'm why sorry. that didn't happen. Why that didn't, well, so it's not normally distributed here because there's discrete groups. But you could just use their scores instead of their groups. I could use that scores. I just, yeah. I mean, I, I could try it, but. I mean, I'm just wondering if that would be a more direct way of getting it, making the same point. To just say, well, all of the, for all of those categories, their scores mediate any gender effect. Because that's what she, that's what the red boxes show. Right. It just it violates an assumption of mediation. Right. It, vi it right. No, no. I know. I understand why you can't do that with this analysis, but I'm asking right. why. Why not? Would running the other analysis yeah. Yeah. basically yeah. get you back to those red boxes? Is that what this means? I was just trying to figure out what this means. Right. OK, thank you. Now, no, I'm sorry I misunderstood your question. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say that running that, running that analysis would get to these boxes. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. So these, these four boxes here, these four blue boxes, would be the scenarios in which accounting for the PAQ actually gets you more yeah. variance. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised, by the way, by their agency findings at all. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that was just a <laughs> slow plot. Can, can, I just, can I just elaborate on that for a sec? I'm not particularly surprised either, but they did, men and women did differ on the agency scale, which is the PAQ masculine. But I think it has more to do with um, the way we coded these narratives than it has to do with actual gender differences in agency. So, anyway. Um, so then my other question is, I don't know if this is methodological or theoretical, but you had this really nice um, model at the beginning with those three functions of memory. Mm -hmm. um, social, self, and then like something about Direction. decision. Something about decision making. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I, I am coachist. I don't have a good autobiographical memory. <laughs> um, and I'm also not gender stereotypical. So, um, <laughs> so direct. Okay. So, but all of your feminine traits in that PAQ were sort of all on that relation between social and self. There wasn't really anything there about directive, except maybe agency. Right. So, but there are a lot of stereotypical differences between men and women in terms of how directive they are, how directive we think they are, that aren't being captured by those. So have you ever thought about expanding the set of stereotypical traits that you use? Because it seems like you're getting a lot of really interesting stuff out of those as individual traits. Um, um, to include a more balanced set from this entire model. And what would that look like, I guess, if, if you ever thought about that in terms of the self and the directive components? Because so much of that was social emotional differences. Right. Right. So that's a great idea. Uh, thanks. I've got my next study now. Um, there's, there's something called the reminiscence function scale that, that uh, captures these. So, or the, the tail, the thinking about life experiences scale. So, uh, it would be great to use that as, um, as a, a potential mediator or, or covariate in the future. It might relate to Nathan's question. 
question too, right? Because this idea right. that a lot of this in the pro-social, it's all on that top one. Right. And that's what's mostly explaining but and this is this is also the one that differs by gender. So well, the, it's the one. It's the one you've. I'm just. That's why I'm saying if you ask about a more expansive set, right. if, if, if that's what you come up with, that's sure. But to be a little more balanced about, no, I, I get about it. the I, set of alternative stereotypes you could have on those other. Yeah, absolutely, 100. percent What I just meant by that last comment was that the data show gender differences on the social subscale. They don't really show gender differences on the other subscales. That's not to mean they can't act as as mediators or, or important covariates. Uh, but that's why we start. That's why we started where we started. Uh, I want to add in our study with narrative though, since there are some indication that men are more likely to use memories for hierarchy function than messes. There you go. See, that's what right. that was my. It would be a nice. It would be a nice addition. The thing is, we study a lot of studies. So you have, we have culture in our study. Mm -hmm. People always draw, you know, refer to the studies by looking at culture differences. But there are a lot of other interesting findings in those different. Studies are kind of lost as a result. Yeah. I, yeah, we had to. Sorry, someone else might want to ask me a question. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. So your findings kind of hit at this possibility, but there are those who would argue that uh, gender, race, and other seemingly immutable characteristics uh, can be uh, more accurately understood as a as a composite that can be, in some cases, disaggregated to its constituent elements. And so the question is, I'm wondering, I'm curious about whether taking a kind of constructionist perspective on gender versus an essentialist one that it seems like you're taking here might address some of the sort of causal inference issues that everyone is sort of alluding to. Um, I, I apologize for making it seem like I was taking an essentialist point of view. I thought I was taking a constructionist point of view, right? Because the whole, the whole notion of the gender, t gender typical traits mediating the analyses is because, well, this is what's building it. Yeah. No, I, guess I'm, but, I guess I'm asking, you know, in terms of taking the, these mediation analyses and, and bringing them into the lab and manipulating some of these gender stereotypic uh, attributes. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like a great idea. I'm, the problem is I'm not a social psychologist. I, I, I hope that wasn't offensive, but uh, like I don't. Neither am I. Right, so I, I just, I, I guess the question is, when we, when we bring an individual into a lab and we say, tell us about your memories, if I start manipulating them, if I start using experimental manipulations to get them to do something different, then I'm no longer studying autobiographical memory, I'm studying my manipulation. Um, so I have to, I have to think more carefully about what you're suggesting because I've, I've thought at a number of different junctures of, well, could I get people to narrate differently? And if I did, what would that tell me? Would that tell me, right? It seems as though it's a much more, um, in the moment manipulation and then we'd have to think about the, the long-term effects, so. I, I, well, you're getting people to narrate differently when they talk to men versus talk to women. You're right, so that's, so that's what I was doing in that one study, right? So, so I was. But you're halfway there, just drink the rest of the cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have me convinced. Yeah. <laughs> if gender is context specific, then it makes sense you can manipulate uh, right. the gender tree to see whether that manipulation can lead to different memories, right? It's a powerful test of the gender difference, I would yeah. say. Same as the culture, I'm sort of in the middle of this, and it, it, it seems to me one of the things I kept thinking about during this is trying to distinguish between autobiographical memory and the reporting of autobiographical memory. Yeah. And I mean, the fact that the, when you report to a woman, you say different things than you report to a man, that would suggest that maybe the memory might be the same, and where the differences are is in the reporting. So is there, is there a way to, you know, other ways or better ways to get at that distinction between what's in there and what gets reported? So I would, I need, I need to think about what you're asking. Uh, because I, I've thought about it at, at, at different occasions and it, it gets back to this, this fundamental question about what we mean when we talk about memory. And I think that people mean different things. And I'm, 
coming, I, you know, I'm coming from my cognitive training that uh, is really thinking of, I, I guess, so I, I, was, I was reading this, reading this book by, by a psychologist by the name of Jens Brockmeyer this summer, and um, he, he emphasizes that right, Ebbinghaus's memory work Right, way back, that started talking about memory, and the analogies we've used to describe memory over the years are storage or storehouse analogies. Right? Whether it's a computer, whether it's, right, it's a warehouse, we've analogized that memory is a place where something is stored, but that it's an analogy, and we've taken the analogy too far, and that it's a dynamic process that when you recall, Right? No two recalls are the same because you're, you are so influenced by context that it then changes recall. And we know that a shift in recall has the ability to change your memory. So finding a fact of the matter is a really hard thing to do. And, and I, I would think that it, the answer, the, the, right, that it's, it's going to be somewhere in between, that, that there are more stable patterns and there are more variable patterns, and that we're going to need different methodologies to get at different pieces of them. I think that's the best I can do with that question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, see, I wonder, uh, I really like the idea about gender atypicality, mm -hmm. you know, and to restore this uh, individual mechanism to, you know, to explain gender differences. Um, you know the gender difference in memory is not specific to or limited to autobiographical memory, but to episodic memory in general, right? right. So in that, in that research, you can use a variety of you know, materials, like asking people to remember photos, asking people to remember a list of words, and you know, all that, or asking people to remember faces, and so forth. Across all those methodology, women in general outperform men, at least the moderate level of you know, good performance, better performance, right? Except in situations that involve spatial recording, right? We remember space. So men can do slightly better, or maybe it's equal as, as women. So there is, in general, there is a sort of moderate, uh, uh, better performance among women than men. So do you think this sort of idea about gender, uh, gender typicality would apply to, you know, explain findings? This kind of lab-based um, study on episodic memory, and I wonder what kind of things underlying uh, are there any kind of biological traits underlying gender typicality or other sort of mechanism, or even brain mechanism involved to explain those gender differences. Right. So. It's funny because you're asking the question the opposite way of how I've been asking the question. I've been asking, uh, are the, maybe these autobiographical memory differences are just the result of episodic differences that we already know exist. Um, but you're saying, well, maybe the gender typicality is actually contributing to the episodic differences. Um, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I'm, I've run episodic memory tasks as a covariate in some of these studies and have had little success in finding cross correlations between these methods and the episodic memory methods. It was one word, like one type of word list, so I don't have extensive data on it. But in the, in the, in the review paper that I referred to at the beginning of the talk, I, I go through that literature and episodic memory and ask, ask whether they are related. Um, so, I think it's an open question. I think it's possible, and I hadn't really thought of it in those terms of the directionality going in the way you just suggested. But it's, yeah, it's still quite possible. A lot, a lot of similarity in what's going on in the two different literatures. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat>